Steve Ulriksen and welcome to a new episode of a talk about Elvis. Or new, maybe it's not that new, because we're going all the way back to 1993. It's actually my first interview I made with Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana. Later on I made several other interviews with them. But now you're going to enjoy this one from 1993. I went all the way to Nototen in Norway to make the interview. Unfortunately I was not alone, so I had a limited time to make my interview. And I had to fit my questions in together with the other two radio stations who did interviews. And the reason for that is Scotty Moore, he didn't want to answer the same questions again and again. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Remember to subscribe because I'm going more down into the archive and finding a lot of interesting interviews and maybe also songs and music that you'll be able to watch on my channel in the near future. So subscribe so you can get information when a new episode is coming out. Well. Now it's time to go back to 1993 and my meeting with Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana. Have fun. Once upon a time, 1954, I've told this story 10 million times. We could do this together and get it all at the same time, you know? So, I usually don't so, so I don't ask the same questions. Uh, I was working with a band called the Starlight Wranglers. We'd put a record out on Sun Records. And then Bruce Sam, I met Elvis. Took Elvis in the studio for an audition, and out of the audition came the first record. That's putting a cap on it. I mean, it's in print so much, you just fill in the blanks. DJ Fontana, you were Elvis' drummer, and the first time you met Elvis? Oh, uh, it was about 19, well, late 54, 1954. They had already cut a couple of records. Well, that's all right, my life. And they were playing them in like Texas, Louisiana, and Arkansas. And, uh, they had a chance to go to the Louisiana Hayride, which is a show like the Grand Ole Opry is today. You know, it's a country show. And that's where I first met Scotty, Bill, and Elvis. They were down there doing a the show. And they asked me to work behind them you know, just that one, one night. And then they come back a couple more times and say, would you work with us again? I said, yeah. So uh, then they was going to go to Texas for maybe three or four days. Asked you to go to Texas with him. And then went back home and said, You know, if we get any more shows, would you work with us some more? I said, Yeah, let's get the show. So that's kind of how it started slow, you know. They, they, they didn't have a lot of shows, you know. So as they got the shows, they would call me. I'd go in. I would like to talk a little about Elvis' period at uh, Sun Records from 54 to 55. And that, as far as I know, uh, both Sam Phillips and the owner of the Sun Studio and Mary Kester, his uh, secretary, claim that they discovered Elvis. Do you know? Oh, you have to ask Scotty that. Okay, who's right? Well, yes, they, they discovered him if you could consider that Elvis had gone. Sam had a his Memphis recording service. Uh, so anybody could go in and rent the studio to make a personal record or something. So Elvis had been in. Uh, in sometime in 1953, and he made an acetate for his mother for a birthday. Marion uh, liked his voice and had just kept his name and address on file. So I guess you could say she discovered his name in the file. 
because we were talking about who we wanted to try to record or what, and she remembered him. And uh, Sam gave me his telephone number, and I called him, asked him to come over my house and uh, to see what kind of songs he did. And and again, we, we from that we went into the studio for an audition. It was an audition. Experimental research. Sam just wanted to see what his voice sounded like on tape. And that's the reason there was only two, two musicians there. From that, the first record came out. DJ, you never played drums during the 1954-55 uh, Sun Studio sessions, but you played uh, on the drums on several of Elvis' 1954-55 concerts. Yeah. Why is that so? Well, because they lived in Memphis. And I didn't live in there, so they were just going to the studio and cut stuff. And actually, it, it was a case of finances. They didn't have any money to call me and say, fly to Memphis or drive up. You know, they couldn't pay it. You know, so it was just they just had to do it on their own. That, that's the main reason. They just didn't have any money to transport me back and forth. Actually. But uh, do you know uh, who were the drummers we can hear on these uh, sound studio sessions? Do you know any, any names? Yeah, or, or Johnny, like Johnny Bonero was one. And what was the other guy we were talking about last night? Jimmy Lott. Jimmy Lott. Jimmy Lott was another one. They were only on like maybe two sides, I think. I'm not, I forgot to remember something else. I'm not even sure what they were. But it was just two different guys. Okay. Uh, Scotty, concerning Elvis recording on That's Right Mama in 54, <laughs> is this lunch break story true? This is true. Can you tell the listeners what's happened? I guess you've told it millions of times mm -hmm. before, but once again. We were having a break, drinking a cup of coffee and coke. Sam was in the control room. The control room door was open. Elvis had a lot of nervous energy. And during this break, he just picked up his guitar and started uh, clowning around, jumping around the studio, singing That's All Right Mama. Bill picked up his bass and started slapping it and just, in general, acting crazy, you know. Rele just the uh, release, releasing tension. And uh, so I picked up my guitar and started to join in with him. And about that time, Sam came out and said, what are y'all doing? I said, we don't know, just goofing around. He said, well, don't sound bad, so let's goof around a little bit more, put it on tape, see what it sounds like. How was it working with Elvis in the studio? Was he hard to work with or what? No, very easy to work with. Uh, we were all inexperienced, so we all did our own thing. You know, there was no, um, there was no regimentation really from anyone other than Sam would have you go over different songs and try and. Uh, but not from a musical standpoint, you know, play this or play that. Just to... So he wasn't the boss, you were a team. Right, yeah. When you began recording with Elvis in 54, no one knew who he was, but uh, two years later in 56, he became well known all over the world. And it changed much from, from 54 to 56 because of that? No, it didn't change too much from 54 to 56. We were. Of course, when he did the first TV shows is when they started becoming known nationwide. Uh, we were working more and more and more. And, uh, but other than more, more shows, bigger crowds, it was all the same. Mm. DJ, Elvis' second manager, Colin Tom Parker, has often been uh, criticized for the way he, he treated Third Elvis. Minutes. And <laughs> many people uh, says he used Elvis just to get money. What do you think of that? Is that correct? Well, yeah. Well, probably, yeah. But the, he did a lot of good things for Elvis. You know, he got him on all the shows. The old guy worked hard. But, uh, of course, I didn't get along with him, but I didn't have to. But uh, I have to give him you know, a lot of credit because it's hard to take an artist and, and keep an artist up, up to 30 years. That's what he did with Elvis. I, I give him that much credit. He, he knew what he was. He was a good promotion. He wasn't a manager, actually. He, he, that's what he called himself. But the Colonel was a good promotion person. You know, he could take a loaf of bread and promote it, and you think you got, you know, a gold mine. You know. Mm. 
And there have uh, also been people saying that Parker immigrated illegally into the USA and therefore he couldn't go abroad. And as a result of that, uh, neither could Elvis. And that's the reason why uh, he never held any concerts abroad. Well, that's, that's possible, but I've heard the same story. But I'm not sure about, you know, the passports and uh, whether he was illegal. Who knows, you know? Uh, he could have been, but uh, looked like to me after all that years, he would have made himself legal, you know. He wasn't a stupid person, you know, Parker was. But regardless, Elvis wanted to go to Europe and, and, and come over to this part of the world. But it, it, we talked about it after the 68 special we was talking. He said he'd like to go to Europe and do some shows, you know. But it just never did materialize. I don't know if it was management or finances or whatever. It just couldn't be done. Scotty, I read somewhere that before a Little Rock Arkansas concert in May 1956, uh, the airplane you used went out of fuel and that, uh, well, of course, it was a dramatic experience. Uh, comment to that? Do you remember that? Rem remember it quite well. Uh, it didn't run out of fuel. We took off uh, on an empty tank. And when we got up to, luckily got up to altitude and the, uh, I was sitting in the co-pilot seat and the, uh, the guy asked me to hold the wheel while he got his maps out. And just the minute I took the wheel, both engines just kind of sputtered and kind of, when he switched the tank real quick, of course it fired right back up. And it was, uh, yeah, it's dramatic. Yeah. Yeah, had, had it been a couple seconds earlier, you know, in the climb, we probably would have crashed, you know. But he had leveled off, and, uh, smooth and so. So we made it okay. <laughs> okay, let's go on to 1957. Uh, in September this year, Elvis did a, what do you call it, a charity concert in, uh, in Tupelo, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. But, uh, well, you, Scotty, and Bill Black were replaced by two other musicians. Do you know uh, what's the reason why you were not there? Because Bill, Bill and I quit. Okay, you remember who replaced it? Bob Moore and Hank Garland. Okay. The reason why I quit was that... Uh, well, we didn't pay it enough. That's the money. Money. Okay. Anytime you quit the job, it's money in it. <laughs> okay. I want to talk uh, a little about uh, this Bill Black. He was part of the group from 54 to 58. Yeah, him and Scotty were the original yeah. guys. And while you and uh, yeah, while you and Scotty continued playing with Elvis until '68, uh, what happened to Bill after he stopped playing with him? He formed his own group. Yeah, Bill had his own band anyhow, so he was he was just as busy. He had about eight or ten number one records in one year, you know, which is you know, instrumentals. That's almost impossible, you know, for instrumentals to do that. So he was just going everywhere all the time. So he didn't have time to work with Elvis. He was making so much more on his own group, you know, so that's what happened with Bill. And he died in the mid-60s, didn't he? Yeah, 65. He had a brain tumor, sure did. Yeah. Okay. The last time both of you performed together with, with Elvis was during <coughs> uh, his comeback shows in June 68, isn't it? The 68 special, yeah, the, the Black Suit. It, it, wasn't, um, <coughs> it wasn't a comeback special at the time. Yeah. It's later, that's what they call it. It was a Christmas special for, uh, sponsored by Singer, Sony Sheet. But, uh, yeah, okay. These shows showed a raw, powerful Elvis, which, well, the world hadn't seen since many, many years. But to me, it uh, seems that those con concerts meant very much to Elvis, and, and to you as well. They did. That's, uh, that's, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get out of the movie uh, stuff and get back on, you know, in front of the people. So that's what he loved. But the con colonel wanted uh, Elvis to perform in a white suit and sing Christmas songs, didn't he? But then Elvis, well, he didn't agree. I don't know if he did or not. I've heard that, but uh, nobody told me. And so if he did, if he did, he sure went the opposite to from white to black and leather, didn't he? <laughs> sure did. In '69, Elvis was going to have his well real comeback as a stage performer in, uh, in July '69 in, in Vegas. You were offered uh, to join Elvis' band, but you said no. The reason for that? Money. Money. Just money. The Jordanaires uh, at that time, and also DJ, were working sessions 
recording sessions in Nashville three and four a day. I uh, had a recording studio and I was engineering three, four sessions a day. Uh, yes, we got the call. At that time, it was only going to be for two weeks, and what they offered wouldn't even come up to what we could stay home and make in able one week. So it was strictly uh, economics. Mm. After you stopped playing with Elvis, as I said in the, in the 60s, what did you do now? Well, of course, I lived in Nashville, and I, I was recording <coughs> with everybody. You know, a lot of the, most of the country acts. Uh, Got out of car with Marty Robbins, uh, uh, Dolly Parton, Porter Wagner, all these were like country acts. You know? I did that for 10 or 15, 20 years. Different acts you know, all the time. Ringo Starr did an album with Ringo, Tommy James and the Shondells and some stuff with them. Just, that's what I was doing, just recording with everybody else. I had more fun doing that. <laughs> what about you? I was I had a recording studio. Okay, so you worked with that. Yeah, I had my own studio, and then later I sold it and uh, started freelancing. Started doing all of the uh, network uh, shows out of uh, the Opera House and CMA shows and uh, specials. And did that, and then I started a cassette duplicating company. And got involved in that. And in '77, I was died in August. Uh, was that a surprise? Well, of course, it was surprising anybody, be it Elvis or whoever, somebody you know. Remember what you thought or remember the moment you got the message? I remember when I got the message. I don't remember exactly what I thought. But I really don't. Well, when, when those things happen, first thing you think about is, let's, let's get on the phone and see if it's true, actually. You know, you used to hear so many things about Elvis, you know. And most of them were not true, so I said, oh, it can't be, you know. A guy like Elvis never dies, you know. Uh, this is the thing, you know, you got in your mind, you know, that would never happen in a million years. I got on the phone, I called everybody I knew, and I couldn't find anybody, and I thought that was strange. You know, I called Joe Esposito, I called Red West, uh, I called all the guys I could find, you know, and nobody answered the phone. It was, it, everybody had headed toward Memphis, I guess, at that moment. Everybody was just out of pocket. I finally got a hold of Joe down in Memphis, maybe 10 or 15 hours later, actually. And he said it was true, so I, next morning, caught a plane, and then the wife and kids went down, you know. So, you know, just a matter of finding somebody that would verify anything, you know. Last uh, question, Scotty. Is Elvis alive? Many yeah. people think so. I don't think so. I took DJ's word for it. He went to the funeral. You saw Elvis' body? Yes. Yeah, I did. It, it, uh, he's not there at all. We wish he were. You know, I think that's what a lot of the fans in the states they would like to know. They think he was a living. Which I don't blame them. You know, they imagine they see these guys. You know, uh, the sideburns and stuff. I guess maybe that's <coughs> thinking. I don't know. I think. Uh, I think it's wonderful that the people are keeping the music alive. Yeah. He'd be, he'd be very happy about that. So you like all the impersonators and the fan clubs? No. And you don't? No, not impersonators. I love people that sing the songs and do the music. Not impersonators? I don't think you need an impersonator to do the music. <laughs> okay. Well, and what he's saying is the, the suits and, and, and all the mannerisms, some of these guys they get a little overboard with it, you know. They, 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 they're on the stage. It's okay to, to do the act, but when they come off the stage, you know, they, they want to stutter. <laughs> they want to act like Elvis off stage, which we, that's the part we don't like. If you go up there and, you know, you do your act, that's fine. But when you get off, just leave it alone. Okay, Scotty Moore, DJ from Thailand. Thank you for uh, for talking to Red and Arik and uh, looking forward to the concert tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Just one more thing, if you could do a short uh, jingle for me. All right. Hope it's easy. <coughs> yeah, some some of these names are hard <laughs> for us. My shows uh, just have to say the show. My name that's Tequila. So you tequila. Yeah, you managed.
Oh, yeah, I know yeah. that one. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. Tequila. Champs. Tequila? Yeah, tequila. Champs. What does that mean in Danish? Uh, in Danish? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Double? Good. Okay. So, um, take one at a time on both. All right. Yeah, that would do. Hmm? Turn it up, turn it up. Turn it up. Okay. Here we go. Hello, you listen to t t Tequila Radio. Uh, was that your name? Was that the, st the show's name? Show's name. Okay. Stop. Radio Larvik. Uh, you listen to Radio Narvik. Larvik. Larvik. Tequila. Maybe, maybe you can splice it out in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Scott, your turn. Hello, this is Scotty Moore saying you're listening to Radio Larvik and your program is Tequila. Thank you very much. Use his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very yeah much. we'll use, use guys. It's good and clean. You know, yeah. The jacket and everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, there's so many pictures. <laughs> they're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. The cigarettes, yeah. That was a tour? Uh, yeah, the, uh, Philip Morse. Yeah. Sponsor. Okay. They used to do a lot of those sponsor shows like that. Okay. Uh, they had everybody on those shows. And that's an RC in New York. Yeah. It was, it was sponsored by. You had to buy the cigarettes. You had to get in. And you, yeah. You give them to them at the door like a ticket. And you, they would get in free. Oh, here's a good year too. Look at you. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now wait, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I think that was maybe a, a Memphis. It looks like that. Kind of. Yeah. That, it's early because of those yeah, striped those shirts. shirts. Yeah. We, I think that's when we had the two stages at the auditorium down there. Yeah. And mid top full scene? Yeah, I think so. We worked there a couple of times. Okay. Okay. You need to do this one with the white. Yeah. You were a long way, weren't you? Yeah. Looks yeah. like I was just run off every corner. Uh, DJ, yeah. uh, when did your interest in music start? Oh, probably high school, I guess. High school. Yeah, uh, uh, I was in the high school bands. Uh, uh, that's where I actually started playing uh, in the concert band, the marching band, all that stuff. With drums? Yeah, well, it was just a field drum, you know. Yes. And the parades and all that stuff. That's where we really got started. You weren't singing or something like that? Oh, no, no, never, never did sing. You kept you away from that? Yeah, uh, no, that, would, that would have been a disaster, actually, <laughs> if I tried to sing. I, I pantomime good and lip sync real good, but that's about it. That's about it. As long as I don't have to sing. Uh, I have the same question for you, Scotty. When did your interest for music start? Oh, when I was around eight years old. Uh, my dad and uh, three brothers all played uh, instruments, and uh, uh, about the time all of them left home, got married, what have you, uh, I got to an age that I could really knew what I was doing, <clears throat> and I guess I was just hard-headed enough. Said, "Well, by gosh, they ran off and left me. I'm gonna do something too." So, get at it. You took a guitar to play, or yeah, yeah. yeah. What kind of music did you play? Just the country or? different things, you know. Uh, then, then I didn't have any preference really. Uh, when did you start for real to play uh, music professional? Uh, actually, when I came out of the, the Navy in 1952, uh, I had a group in in the service, and uh, while we were in dry dock in Bremerton, Washington. Uh, had a radio show up there and it just really, the bug really took hold, bit me good. DJ, when did you start out uh, playing professional like Scotty? Oh, well, during high school actually, those days, uh, uh, mostly on weekends, you know, I worked little clubs around town, little bars, Kind of a back then, it had like what we call cocktail music, real quiet, easy, you know, uh, piano, bass, and drums, and 
that's really where I got started, working in these little small clubs. I think everyone gets started about the same place, probably. Was it a chance that dream came true? Stop playing music, or did you dream about being a truck driver or something like that? I didn't want to be nothing. <laughs> no, I, no, I never, you know, it's just one of those things that happened. I, I was, <coughs> like I said, in high school with a bunch of guys, and everybody played instruments, you know. We had some trumpet players, and uh, we had some piano. Everybody was musicians, the guys that, you know, you hang around with, so you have to learn to play something, so. You can get girls that way. Yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of what I did, just to, uh, they needed a drummer in the band. I said, well, I'll play, you know, what's the difference? And that, that's kind of how they get, most of it's by accident, you know, you, you never know what's going to happen. I didn't. What about you, Scotty? Was, was it a childhood dream came true playing music, or was you dream about being a truck driver or a policeman or something like that? No, I was probably dreaming of being very wealthy. Wealthy? Yeah, wealthy, rich. Rich, yes. Yeah, without working. Without working? Yeah, it didn't work out that way, though. <laughs> Even the music turned into work, you know. Uh, I, you're still enjoying playing music? Uh, yes, I still enjoy it. Uh, Age and arthritis is getting me, but uh, I still still enjoy it. Do you take around the world to Elvis conventions and that kind of things? No, I haven't. All it. Let's say I didn't play any for 24 years. I just started back last year, and uh, uh, DJ has been doing it for 15 years. He's been all over the world, and he's been after me for several years to do some of it with him. And uh, we're we're having a good time. Two of us traveling. Were you famous overnight with That's All Right, Mama, when you and Elvis and Bla Bill Black recorded? No, no, no. Was it hard work? Very hard work. Did it take a long time before it came, became a national success? Well, Elvis didn't become a national success till, till he did uh, uh, the television shows, and he was already on RCA at the time. And That's All Right, and all those early Sun records were big throughout the south, southeast, and we were playing a lot of shows off the strength of the airplay that they were getting, but we wasn't making very much money and they were little small places and things. Uh, how was it to make records and play together with Elvis? Was it uh, funny or hard work or how was it to play with? Uh, I don't quite, I mean, he was easy to work with, and we had, uh, uh, it was fun making records, yes. Yes, and you were the manager for him for the first year. Right. Yeah. Why, why did you stop managing him? That was just, all that was was for protection. Uh, there were some, quote, unquote, shady characters around trying to get him to sign uh, management booking contracts and such, and uh, we just weren't ready at that time. So I signed a contract with him so he wouldn't have to lie. He'd say, I'm already under contract, and let it go to him. Many actors have tried to play you in TV movies. Uh, who do you think made the best uh, act? Who, who were most like you of those actors? Have you seen them? The one in the series. The one in the series. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the series. You were a very busy man. The phone was always ringing. Mm -hmm. Was it like that? Mm -hmm. uh, that part was true. It must have been hard for a marriage at that time. You were running around like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was stressful. Stressful. <laughs> uh, DJ, uh, you came in to play with Elvis. You have played before that. Oh, well, no, yeah, the Louisiana Hayride. Louisiana Hayride. Yeah, it, it was a show like the Grand Ole Opry is, you know. It was that, you know, it was all country show. They had uh, a lot of big country acts, you know, back in the 50s, Webb Pierce, Fair and Young. They were all country acts on that show. Yes. And uh, Hank Williams Sr., he was in and out. They had them all in and out at one time or another. And it was just a, a Saturday night show is all it was. Was it Elvis who contacted you to try to get you to play drums with him? Or? No, I, I was just there, you know, that Saturday night, you know, when they come in. Mm -hmm. and, and Scotty asked me would I help him out, you know. He was like the manager, as we said, mm -hmm. you know. And Except for free. Yeah, it was no, 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 money. no pay. Yeah. But, and so I would, you know, we played, uh, they had 
two or three little records going. And they, they didn't have about two songs, huh? Mm -hmm. That was it. So I didn't have to learn much, you know. <laughs> that's all right, and a couple more, and that's about all we did. What do you think about playing with it, with Elvis and Scotty and Bill? Who was the most uh, rare person to play together with? Well, Maybe all the guys were, Maybe no, no, all the guys were fun. <laughs> they were all fun to work with. It was a matter of everybody working together as a team, you know. Uh, Bill was the, the, uh, the kind of the comedian. Scotty was real serious. Elvis was, I don't know, he was, uh, had a lot of nervous energy, so he was just everywhere all over the stage. And I couldn't move because I was sitting down, you know, I had to, and so that's about uh, the extent of uh, my moving around doing anything on the stage. I had to sit there, you know, and watch everybody else. They could move around, you know, I couldn't do anything. So I was sitting down behind drums, you know, Bill could walk way over there, Scott is way over there, Elvis is way out front. I just had to sit and watch everybody, you know. What, what about the time you made pictures together with Elvis? You made, uh, what, what, how many pictures, three or four? Or? Yeah, it wasn't very, we, we did all the mu music tracks, but we did like uh, Loving, you, Loving You, I think, King Creole, and, and a couple more, or GI Blues. There's one more I can't remember. Jailhouse Rock? Jailhouse. We actually did four visual pictures, but uh, that's no fun, pictures is no fun. No fun? No, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's hard work actually. And uh, so we decided we, we really didn't want to do that uh, after those pictures. So we would go out and spend maybe two weeks or three weeks doing the soundtracks to all of them. Then we'd go home, you know. Didn't you, didn't you like us in uh, GI Blues in our little Bavarian outfits? A little Bavarian outfits? Oh, yeah, did you see the, the, uh, uh, it was in a bar or something. Like the, yeah. yeah, a little bit of, uh, and we'd go out at five o'clock in the morning and put on these little, it's like in the Alps, you know, the Bavarian. Yes. Uh, and uh, you get makeup all over your legs and all that stuff. And it's, oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And then yeah, you sit probably. around all day looking stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had a lot of fun about it at this time. Uh, no, it wouldn't. It wasn't no fun, actually. Yeah. It's too much standing around doing nothing. You know, you, know, you just. You have to get up at 5 in the morning. And you have to be through the gates at seven. Uh, you go down and make up and wardrobe and you know whatever they're going to give you for that day to wear. And, and you're on the lot, on the set at eight o'clock, and you'll sit till noon. And, you know you go take a break, and go get something to eat for thirty minutes, and go back, and you sit till five or six, and you go home. And you hadn't done anything all day. And you know you could do that for three weeks uh, running. And then all of a sudden they, they, they'll shoot 30 seconds and you're through. So that, that got kind of old for us. You know. Of course, I always had stuff to do all the time. He was in all the scenes. So he had to work. And we were just standing around mostly watching, you know, watching all those actors do what they're supposed to do, I guess. That time, Elvis got a lot of what they call it, friends to be around him, to take care of him, to hit, get his cool and so on. What is your opinion about all these friends? Oh, they were nice guys. Uh, he gave everybody a job, I think. Uh, he, he felt sorry for everybody. And if, if, you, if you drove up and act like you needed a job, he said, oh, well, come go to work for me. I don't care, you know. <laughs> and he just hired you. He didn't care who you were. He just hired you. And, and some guys would come in and stay a week or two, and some guys stayed for 30 years, you know. Yeah. But he had so many different people he felt sorry for. And, they was on his payroll, and they all, you know, they had kids and families, and, and he wasn't about to let them starve, you know. So he had to hire all these guys. They had to do something, you know, get his Coca Colas or shine his shoes, or you know, he gave him a job to do something, drive the cars or whatever. Yes. Which sort of person of those friends do you think was the most important for Elvis, who gave him most support? Many have talked about he had not enough. Support. I don't think I don't think none of them, none of them. were good for him. Not in the long run. Not in the long run. I, I think all the guys meant well, uh, but uh, there were just too many guys around, too many people around that, that he had to really worry about. You know, he was worried about the kids and their families, and he made sure they all, you know, they were all, you know, set pretty well. And, but I don't think any of them were real good for him. There were just too many people around. And maybe that's why he got a divorce. You know, it's too many people around the house 24 hours a day that, that would get pretty old to a woman, you know, if I was a woman I'd run them all off. <laughs> <laughs>
She did one time. She ran a whole bunch of them off one time. Fired every one of them, told them all to get out of the house. But then he felt sorry for them. He'd call them on the phone. Well, come back and uh, see me sometime. And the next thing you know, they're all back in the house, you know. Yeah. Uh, they'd go for a day and stay uh, six months, you know. Free food, what the heck, I'd, I'd stay too, you know. <laughs> was, he, was she a good wife and was she a good uh, Yeah, I, oh, she's a nice lady. Yeah, I, I, I like her actually, you know. Uh, she's always been good to us, you know, and friendly, and, uh, she, and she'll go out of her way to speak to you. You know, she's nice. But, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are married, uh, but uh, if you're married and, and, and you've got a bunch of people under your feet 24 hours a day, for a woman, that's no good. You know, and I, I don't blame them. I'd, I'd, I'd get rid of all of them. And I think that had a lot to do with the, with the divorce. There's just too many people around. And she never had any time with him, you know, uh, by themselves. Mm. So I, I don't blame her, you know, a bit. I have another question. I don't think you've got enough credit for the things you did for Elvis and the and the beautiful. Well, be uh, sure and give me some credit. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, how do you feel about it? Uh, do you feel you have done that credit for it? Three years. I've never never really thought about it. Oh. Uh, DJ and Bill always called me the old man. The old man? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you were so serious. So. Yeah, he was serious. So I had to go get the money. We I weren't serious. Get the car, pack the car. Nobody could read a map. You know, just little things like that. Uh. Just make you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> uh. DJ, DJ, get me to tell you what a good driver he is and how he reads the map. Oh, Ask him how to get through St. Louis, for instance. It took me 10 hours to get through St. Louis. <laughs> I kept going around in circles for hours and hours, and I'd always come back to the same place. I couldn't figure out how to get out of there. It was about daylight. I finally woke these guys up, and they said, well, where were we at? I said, St. Louis. He said, we was in St. Louis 10 hours ago. I said, we're still here. <laughs> I said, you better get me out of town. So somebody got behind the wheel and got me out of town. I didn't, I didn't want to wake them up, you know, and, and we, we wasted about 10 hours. And then came late for the concert or something like that? No, no we made it okay, made but it was just a matter of, I couldn't get out of town. So I, I wasn't really good at, at map reading. If you get me on a straight stretch, I could drive pretty good. But you get me on an expressway somewhere or going through a city, I stayed lost all the time. Yeah. In uh, the movie Prince of Made, or not movie, serial, uh, you were running around and selling records. Uh, no. Was that right? Or no. was that just no. a crazy idea? Just something the writers put in there. Yes. Uh, Bill sold uh, pictures yes. on the road, but we never sold any records. Never? No. no. But what about time? Uh, in the serial, uh, it's much like uh, Bill Black is the what can we call it? A bad criminal, guy. Bad guy, yeah. He was wrong. always arguing with Elvis. Is that right? No. Never. Completely wrong. Completely. Bill was one of the nicest guys you'd ever meet. Yes. But that's something that the writers have put into it. Yeah. What do you think about Elvis movies? All the movies he made? Do you think they're good or do you think they're bad or what? No, I've only seen two or three of them. Only seen two or three of them. I could tell from the music we did. That they were... Right. <laughs> they just rubber stamp. Yes. That was only for the money he made them. Right. Yeah. No, yes. not, not, not. It wasn't the money that he made them. He, he, he did them because contracts were signed with the colonel and the, the movie people. And he, uh, their relationship, whatever else, would go ahead and do them. Yeah. After 1969, uh, uh, what did you see Elvis again? No, 68 was the last time I saw him. 68 was mm -hmm. the last time. You never heard from him or anything? No. Yeah. Was that because you didn't want to work with him? He didn't call you or? No, the, the la well, the last contact we had actually was when the, uh, they called and asked us to go do the Vegas stuff. and. Uh, Everybody was so busy in Nashville, we just couldn't couldn't do it. If we of course, if we'd known it was going to be an ongoing thing, it would have been different. But it was only for two weeks at the time. Um, was it Elvis' fault that you didn't get enough money to play, or do you think it's Colonel Parker was behind it? 
Well, I, you'd, uh, you'd have to give Elvis some blame because he could have interceded and, uh, and helped us. But primarily it was management. Yeah. Was it too weak to do anything in this? Or was it because he was too lazy or what? Mm, uh, it's hard to say. Just uh, uh, Elvis didn't like uh, confrontation, you know. You want to please everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you see, uh, seen the Elvis on tour and Elvis in concert, and uh, that's the way it is. I've uh, seen some of them. Yeah. Some of them. Could you see how it would go with Elvis? When did you see there was something wrong with him? No, I couldn't tell from watching those. You can tell. Yeah. What about you, DJ? You well, I saw him a few times. I went down and. After I after I quit, I went down to Grayson a couple of times. Uh, just going through town, I'd stop. And me and the wife and kids would go by and see him, you know. So I kept in more contact. I saw him a couple of times. He come to Nashville to do some work, and I'd go to the studio and talk to him, you know. So uh, we we were still friends, and uh, but we just didn't work together, you know. That's all. Uh, but I didn't know he was sick. But uh, what I did, I guess I'll take that back. I knew it because uh, sometimes he'd come to Nashville and he'd end up in the hospital. And I knew a bunch of nurses that worked at the hospital. And uh, they would call me and say, well, Elvis is back in the hospital again, you know, in Nashville. And uh, they'd tell me, you know, how he was feeling and everything. So I kept up with him that way around, around the bowel, you know. Did he change the last years? Uh, Tom Jones has said that Elvis changed uh, a lot uh, the last two or three years of his well, life. I didn't see him much after, you know, after a little while. I didn't see him at all. No. Uh, you know, you read about him like everybody else in the papers, but it seemed like he was doing okay, you know. Uh, but I'm not sure you know, what kind of attitude he had. I just don't know. Because I, well, I wasn't there at the time, you know. Uh, I was talking with John Wilkinson for some months ago, and he told me that from 1974, he and the band could see that, was, that there was something wrong with Elvis. Uh, he was not the same guy anymore. He's probably getting sicker, I guess. You know, he, was, yeah. he, he had, uh, from what the nurses told me, he had a little glaucoma. You know, he had some kind of colon problems. So he was kind of actually falling apart. You know, the last few years, he was getting sicker and sicker by the day. I guess, yeah. and uh, he evidently had a bad heart. Uh, you know. So he, he was physically wasn't you know, just getting where he couldn't get around as much, you know. Do you think uh, Elvis so, uh, thought about it? Because many of the bands I've talked to, they say that uh, many of them have told him, I don't know if it's right, that he should stop making the concerts because they could see it didn't feel well. well and Elvis said, yeah, I know, I know, I'll, I'll do it <coughs> next time and no more concert. And then he went back and made another concert. Yeah. What? You know, it's like Sky mentioned earlier, he loved the people, you know, and so he felt more comfortable on the stage than sitting at home doing nothing. He'd rather be out, uh, you know, singing, uh, talking to his fans if he could, you know, and uh, so I think that's what kept him going, actually. Uh, even though he was sick, he said, well, I'll go out and do some more concerts for the people. He, he loved the fans, actually, you know. He should have quit. Uh, Years ago, actually. Yes. Scotty, I have some last questions. And um, can you tell us about some rare moments with Elvis, some funny moments you recall? Not really. I mean, there's so many little little things, but uh, nothing of, uh, mostly personal things. Most personal. You don't want to tell. Yeah. Um, what about you, TJ? Do you recall anything? No, not really. I'm like Scotty. You know, we did so many things, it's hard to uh, pinpoint one particular thing. But he was funny. He had a good sense of humor. Uh, he would uh, he pull different things on you all the time. You never know what he's going to do, you know. Uh, uh, just uh, And I can could, I could relate to that story because he would, he would do something like that. He would jump out of the car and go hitchhiking. He didn't care. You know, and he would jump in your car and go riding with you. So he would, he, he was capable of doing funny things. Yes. Uh, he was always doing things. You never know what he might do, you know, even though he had, 
uh, he didn't need any bodyguards actually he could take care of himself pretty good uh, that was just to keep a big crowd but you know if if you get up and, and, and said something wrong to him well he'd knock your head off he was good yes yeah he was very strong and, and fast fast he, he could hit you ten times and you don't know where it's coming from he hit a guy one night he had a ring on it was about oh maybe that thick the back of it and he hit this guy so hard he broke the ring and uh, he, what made him mad we, he was arguing with Elvis and I was standing right here and I said Elvis don't put up with that I said knock his head off and Bill was on the other side and Bill said yeah Elvis you don't have to put up with that but he's he's not that big he's a big old guy you know and, and we were just kind of harassing him and then this guy he went to swing and, and Scotty grabbed his arms when well, he threw Scotty over this bar rail and that made him mad then he hit the guy he finally said no oh, that's enough he threw Scotty over this rail I'll have to get him for that and I felt sorry for the guy he hit him so hard and then he you know he, he went the, they, the security finally come in the hotel and got him this this guy whoever he was and, uh, and he got outside and he started fighting with a policeman and they whooped him a while and he's just a big mean guy you know and the next morning they called back, the police did, and, the, and the, the guy had a wife and a family and everything, and Elvis said, no, I said, you know, don't, uh, if, you know, if he's got to pay a fine, come and I'll pay the fine for the guy. He probably doesn't have any money, you know, he probably, he's got a wife and a family. And he said, if it's a hundred dollars, come and I'll pay for it. Let him, let him, just let him out, you know, let him go back home. The, the guy was, <clears throat> he was mad because uh, his wife was, uh, had Elvis's picture in your wallet. And not him. Oh. And not him, right. right. <laughs> was there many of that kind of situation at that time? No, no, no. But the girls were very crazy about you know, when you appeared on the stage and so on, they went crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what? A question I didn't ask you. Uh, did you recognize anything about the newspapers they wrote about uh, this maniac, Elvis Presley, Elvis the Pelvis, and whatever they called him? Do you recognize some of those articles at that time? Did you see them? You, you had the band? Oh yeah, we saw them. You saw them? What did you think? thought they were dumb. Yeah. Do you think it gave you more success? Probably. Probably. Mm -hmm. Everybody went out to see. Yeah, he wasn't doing anything, yeah. you know, that uh, exotic or anything. He was, a, he was an entertainer. Uh, when the Especially the girls when they started uh, screaming and hollering from some of these little moves and things. Well, they just started <coughs> embellishing on them more and more. Uh, uh, at last, what is your plans for the future? You keep on playing or? To get through today. To get through today? Yes. <laughs> is that so hard? That's it for now. <laughs> That's it for now. Okay, thank you, Scotty. And, um, same thing, if I can get through the day, we'll be lucky. You'll we'll be lucky. Do you yeah. have any plans of making records or so and that kind of thing? Not really, no. Uh, one guy's got some stuff. One day at a time. Yeah, we're just gonna, we never know what's gonna happen. Just, like you said, we'll do it one day at a time. If we stay healthy, we'll do this. If we don't, we'll stay home. You know, if we quit enjoying what we're doing, we'll just stay at home. Yes. Okay, first of all about Heartbreak Hotel. I've always heard that Floyd Kramer plays the piano. No. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But nobody seems to know who it was. Marvin Hughes. You sure? Positive. Yeah. Positive. I was there. Yeah, it was Marvin. But in the new book. The uh, new book, it's Marvin Hughes. Yeah, they think so. No, I don't think so. Like nobody it's agrees. Marvin Hughes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Period. Period. No. How, uh, when you played on the Sun Records, uh, is every record uh, song you made out on the market? Best, Uncle Penn is satisfied? Yeah, you know, that was what, five? I think so. Four or five, that's all. They're all, they're just, they're all out. Yeah, but uh, in some uh, books, them uh, written that uh, you uh, recorded Uncle Penn satisfied. Well, I heard that. It. We heard that, but I, I had never run across it. I just hadn't seen it. Uh, you know, maybe they, maybe he run it once or twice and they erase the tape. Those, you know, you never know what the what the engineers are doing in there. You know, they uh, they may have erased the tapes. You know, who knows? After the first 
a uh, few things we put on the tape where we were actually experimenting. Sam was getting Elvis to sing different type songs, to, listening to his voice. He was trying to determine what kind of material, what he wanted to aim for, country, blues, you know. Is that the uh, Hobble I Love the Moon, You Don't? Uh, two or three of those things, yeah. But after that, after we did the first record, we would go, we would go through different songs, but Sam wouldn't necessarily put them on tape because he then he knew what he wanted to hear. So we'd go, we would rehearse the song, and uh, and he'd say, "No, that's you know, that's you know, that's not what we're looking for." So uh, there isn't uh, any many. Um, and if, if he did put something on tape, he might have went back and erased it and recorded something else over it. You know, tape was expensive. Yes. <laughs> In those days. Yeah. Yeah, they well, do. and they didn't have any money. Yes. Right. At the time, they didn't have any money, so you had to save every, you know, all the tape and everything you could save. Uh, it's like I, like I told someone yesterday, I'm sure in the hindsight, Sam, we should have kept the tape recorded going. All the time. Recorded everything. You don't think about those things. Okay, an important question about the 68 special. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about a third sit-down show. Wrong. No. You sure? Possibly. Yeah. No. Yeah, we know uh, that. The, the pictures you're talking about with the shows that was with uh, uh, Blue Jean. Yeah. And probably, and I think Steve uh, Binder has been asked the same question, and he will tell you there was only two. But even though Elvis had a stand-in, which was Lance Legault, who they could use him for what's called blocking for camera shots, and the pictures that are out are probably, Elvis was in blue jeans because it was during rehearsals, and he was out there singing or something, uh, so lighting, they could set lighting on his face, and things of that nature. Okay, but it's been reported from the United States, I think from the Elvis Presley estate, that they found footage of the rehearsal. They could have took some footage, but it was not a show. Okay. They might have shot some stuff for the people in the booth to look at, to see if they were pleased with lighting and sound or whatever, and the camera angles. Okay. But it was not a quote unquote third sure. show. Okay. <laughs> but were you there all the time? I mean, uh, in yeah. the book, new book says that you only were there for two we were, shows. We were there all the time for our segment. Yeah. So it's not possible that he did a show without you guys? No. No. Not no. a sit-down show in the, in the round. No, that was it. I mean, I stayed keep, a, keep <laughs> trying, but he's going to come out the same. Yeah. I stayed a week a later. I, I stayed a whole week. He, he went home. Uh -huh. And Elvis said, have you got anything to do? I said, no. He said, why don't you stay around a while? I said, okay. So I stayed around for another week. I could go to rehearsals and all that stuff. But there's nothing, there was nothing else done. Okay, but it is possible that, that there was some rehearsal film, actually. They well, could, yeah, they sure. could have shot some, well, it was on tape. They could have shot some tape, like yeah. I say, for, for them, for the director, lighting, technical cameraman, stuff. technical people to look at, to see if they were happy with what they were, what they were doing. Yeah, that's possible. Sure. And they could, they could ask him to sit in, to, like I say, they call, it's called blocking. And they could ask him to sit in because he would have different complexion than, than Lance. Okay. They were about the same size, so for uh, general shots, they would use a stand in. But if they were real close ups and things of that nature, they'd like to have the main character. Lance done a lot of stuff, you know, standing in the yeah, he was a light-headed guy, but when he had to do an Elvis picture, of course, he'd get the side burns and black hair, you know. And he was, they were about the same size. Okay. Okay, a question about Bill Black. This is probably touchy, but uh, Ray Walker of the Jordan Air said he, he was a terrible musician. Is that true? Well, <laughs> compared to what? Yeah. Ray's not a good singer either. Uh, Bill might have been. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Bill might have been. Bill might have been a bad musician for the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, but for us and for Elvis Presley, he was perfect. That's what we needed. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, One hundred percent, maybe the note was true, but the overall rhythm thing was what was important to what we were doing. And if you listen to later things, when he's not slapping the bass, the intonation is much, much better. 
as good as you probably want it to be. So you do. So you're doing two things. You're you're slapping the bass to get a rhythm sound, plus trying to play the notes, and it's very very hard to do. There's a special story about uh, "Baby I Don't Care." Uh, oh, that's when he had the electric, electric bass. Yeah. Remember the? No, couldn't play the intro. What was that? Da oh, da baby, da I don't da care. Da da yeah, da I'm da not da thinking about it too much. Yeah, no, 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 yeah. Too much. Elvis played the bass. Yeah. yeah. Bill, <laughs> just, Bill yeah. actually just got the bass. It was new. And he had never probably picked it up. No, he didn't have to play it. He didn't play it. And, uh, Elvis had this thing in his mind, what he wanted. And Bill said, I can't play that damn thing, you know. And he just threw the thing down and <laughs> he left. Elvis said, I'll play it, you know, so he got to play it. So I was, wasn't a better bass player than Bill Black. Oh, he wasn't a bass player. No, he wasn't a bass player at all. <laughs> but he could play what he wanted to play. Yeah, sounds pretty good on the record. Yeah, he, he played enough uh, uh, of bass to, to get by. He played piano, organ, played a little drums, a little guitar. So, you know, he was, he was a pretty good little musician. He, he could explain to you what he wanted and show you, actually. Okay, one final question for me, anyway. Uh, I read that you played on the, the back of the guitar case on All Shook Up. We did that quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's the question. What, what other songs? Uh, Do you recall that? Shook Up, we did. Uh, uh, no, I was playing the back of the guitar on All Shook Up. You're yeah, but, uh, but it's another one too. Yeah, there was another one. Two or three we did. We got to where we used the guitar quite a bit for some reason. Uh, what was the name of that time? What did you say now? Elvis played? Mm -hmm. play, DJ's playing drums on there. Uh, oh, yeah. Playing so brushes. Yeah, there's another one. Too. Two or three that we play. Elvis just, hold, just got hold it, turned over back, which is one with the leather on it. And he just that's what you did. That the sound is what he was looking for, that, that particular sound. But we did two or three records like that. With that guitar. <coughs> it's just a sound that he liked, and uh, you get into a rut sometimes. Once it, once it, once the record sells, you know, you say, well, we'll do it again, you know, and yeah. maybe, you know, you get another but you can sell it. You, just, you never know what you're going to play. You just do it. But that was the old guitar, the leather guitar. It wasn't a regular guitar. It had the leather cover over it. That's where you had that sound from, right? yeah. the pop. Okay. Uh, one more question. Two questions. Good Rock of the Night, the series, TV series. Is that a good series that uh, almost as it was in the real life? A lot of it was, was um, real close. A lot of it was just made up. What uh, kind of music uh, are you, you like today? Oh, I don't know. I, uh, I really don't listen to the radio much. Uh, these TV uh, things are most of the uh, these country music TV things are terrible. Some of the rock uh, are really bad. What kind? What kind? <laughs> so I don't know. I, I I listen basically when I do listen to be country, you know, country music. Because some of these rock things are, and these raps and it's a lot of you know, it's, <laughs> to me it's, it's, I can't understand what they're talking about in the first place. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're killing policemen and kids and babies. And, and I, I just don't go for that. I just don't go for that at all. That's good to use that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you? What was the question? Uh, what kind of music you listen to? Oh, now? Yeah. Oh, um, jazz mainly, guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Any favorite Elvis record? Uh, as far as. Just uh, one that uh, was hit for his voice. I don't. Don't. I mean, my, probably one of my favorites. Too. But I like the gospel stuff too, though. He sung the gospel stuff really good, so I kind of enjoy listening to the gospel music. Yeah, yeah me too. Yeah, it's <laughs> really good. Okay. So?
cracked up then. Scotty and DG has left the building. Yeah, they're leaving the building. Where's that place at? Yeah, well, just down.